service, what they call broken service, uh, in the early 90s. The uh, government and the military decided to downsize, so they offered early retirement packages. And, uh, I had 17 years at that point, and uh, <clears throat> so I, myself, and it was offered to pilots, so uh, I, myself and a whole bunch of other pilots took advantage of the uh, opportunity, gave you a pension and gave you a severance package, and we all walked out the door and said, we'll be back in five years. And uh, sure enough, five years later, I called up, uh, <laughs> it was a bit of a funny story. I'm working for Kelowna Flightcraft at the time. And uh, I see this little ad in the back of an aviation magazine. It says, if you're a PLT 32A, give this 1-800 number a call. PLT 32A is military parlance or code for pilot. So uh, I thought, well, this must be a startup airline. They're looking for retired military guys. And so I give this 1-800 number a call. And it's my buddy that I quit with in the recruiting office in Ottawa. And he went with uh, Canada 3000 Airlines. So did I, actually. We both left and went to Canada 3. I quit after a year and came out here to clone a flightcraft. And uh, he carried on until he went bankrupt. When they went bankrupt, he uh, decided he was going to go back into the military. And they said, right, we want you to call up all the guys you left with and tell them to come on back. So they had improved the wages and a whole bunch of other things. So I called him and I said, okay, well, you know, I'll come back. And uh, so we're living here in Kelowna and uh, my wife's a nurse and she's working and the kids are in school and so on and so forth. And I went home and I said, you know, honey, I think I'm gonna get back into the military. And she said, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not divorced. <laughs> but uh, I went back in and I commuted from Winnipeg. I worked in the headquarters in Winnipeg and I commuted to, uh, because I was working shift work, they, I called up my penalty box tour and come back in, yes, but you're not going to get an airplane. So uh, I had to do a penalty box tour in Winnipeg at, at a headquarters there for four years. Uh, and then I carried on. So uh, my first aircraft was the top left there, that's a Buffalo. And uh, we just finished retiring them after 50 or 60 years. It was ridiculous. But uh, back in my day, when I flew it on my first tour, 81 to 84, uh, it was a heck of an airplane. It's, it really is a heck of an airplane. It is uh, short takeoff and landing, ideal for search and rescue platform. It's perfect. And uh, could carry a load, could loiter, could you know, do all kinds of good things, short field landings and takeoffs and so on. Because of that, that aircraft had a lot of power uh, just to get off the, air, off the ground in a short distance. So it was fun to fly. Did that for four years or three years in the uh, Ontario, Quebec region. And uh, then I asked, because they're, the buff Buffalo's made by de Havilland, the top right corner there is the Dash 7, also made by de Havilland. And there was two of those in the uh, military inventory. Both of them were located in Lara, West Germany, where we had a military base, and they were used predominantly for VIP transport. So I, we would fly generals around Europe. The governor general came over once and flew her around, um, ministers and so on, going to meetings and whatnot. Really cool job, because uh, wherever the VIP went, which was always nice places, so did we. So, uh, you, uh, as a taxpayer, you would not want to know the catering bill on that airplane. It was ridiculous. We did have one aircraft that uh, had a cargo door in it. That's the one you see there. So we could go straight packs, we could go all the cargo, or we could, on the other aircraft, it had a VIP capsule in the front, no cargo door. So those are two of them in uh, Lara West Germany. The interesting thing about that airplane, we did a lot of air shows with that aircraft because de Havilland wanted us to showcase that aircraft in Europe. And uh, so it's the only aircraft in the Canadian inventory that has the commercial name Dash 7 written down the side of the tail. <laughs> you can't quite see it. But uh, we did a lot of air shows and, uh, and uh, showed off the aircraft. And uh, Norwegian Airline, it, it too is a short takeoff and landing aircraft. So uh, Norwegian Airlines really liked it because uh, some of their runways and the ends of the fjords up in Norway are pretty short and a very steep approach. 
So it was an ideal aircraft for that. Came back, uh, well, then, yeah, from 90 to 95, the lower left aircraft, that's a Boeing 707. And uh, they call it the workhorse of the north because it did a lot of different roles. In that picture, you're seeing it as a air refueler. So we had two drogues, one on each wingtip that we could extend out and uh, an F-18 in that case could plug in and uh, refuel. So we would, uh, when our fighters were deployed to Europe, for example, we would uh, go along with them and keep them topped up with gas and uh, get them all the way across the Atlantic. Uh, it also, two of those aircraft had, we had five all together, and uh, two of those aircraft had cargo doors, and so we could go straight uh, freight or straight packs. We could also put the VIP uh, uh, package into it and uh, fly around the Prime Minister, the Governor General, the Pope, and the Queen, and so on. Uh, did that a few times. Um, the aircraft in the lower right, now there's two there. I flew the AWACS, which is the one in behind with the radar dish on top. Uh, the reason I put that, that picture there, it's air refueling behind the KC-135. And we did a lot of that. And uh, that was my last aircraft to fly. And I gotta say that doing that, air refueling, behind another aircraft that's as big as you are is a little daunting. Probably the hardest thing I've ever done in an airplane. Um, got some more pictures here. I don't know if this is gonna work or not. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the uh, AWACS in particular, because it does a cool job. How do I scroll? Yeah, do that. So that's all AWACS pictures. <clears throat> and so the top left there, is what it looks like out the back end of a KC-135. There is an actual guy sitting there, lying there right at that boom, and uh, watching you plug in, or he plugs into you actually. There's the wings on that boom, and he'll uh, plug into you. But you've got to get your airplane in behind him 15 feet below the tail of his aircraft. And, uh, what speed are you at? What speed? Uh, we're doing about 220, 250, indicated so that's at altitude that's yeah. 29,000 feet yeah. but uh, <laughs> quick story so we are going to we're working on Libya I'm deployed down to Sicily with this aircraft and uh, there's two air two air refuelers that you can refuel behind one is the KC-135 which is another Boeing 707 the other one is a DC-10 that's been fitted for air refueling it's twice the size of a Boeing 707 so anyways, all my training has been behind a KC-135. We get down to Sicily. Okay, we're gonna do an operation in Libya. And Barthel, you're taking off at uh, nine o'clock tonight. And uh, you're gonna hit a tanker south of Sicily and uh, then deploy to your uh, location on the top of Libya. Great, what, uh, it's, a it's a DC-10, a KC-10. I've never refueled behind a KC-10 in my life. And, uh, and I'm thinking, that's an airplane that's twice the size. And when you're air refueling behind these tankers, there's no, there's no technology that keeps you in there. It's just eyeballs, keep that airplane right in front of you and don't move. <laughs> so anyways, I think, okay, all right. So we had, uh, you know, we had a manual, air refueling manual in the back of those pictures. And pictures of what a DC-10 looks like when you're plugged in behind it. So I looked at those pictures. Okay, that's what I've got to, got to do, right? So, anyways, we get out there. We're at altitude, and the sun's going down on the horizon in the in, in the west. And our refueling pattern is east-west. So I I get behind this. I find this KC-10. Get it? You know, start to move in behind it. And uh, just as I'm you know, like 20 feet, 30 feet behind him, we turn and we start going west and there's the sun right below that DC-10, right in my eyes and now I gotta plug in. It was ridiculous. So anyways, I got plugged in. Well, I got, you get stabilized behind this airplane first and then you get permission to, to join. So did that, got permission, plugged in, we're stabilized. And about after, I don't know, 30 seconds or 
And then the pilot comes on the tank and comes back and says, ah, you're a little low. Can you come up about 15 feet? And uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, the whole the whole box that you could move in was only 15 feet. You could go seven and a half feet high, seven and a half feet lower, and uh, and same distance out to the sides. And when I first started air refueling, I was sitting in the jump seat, watching and, and sweating, and uh, they were talking about, these were instructors now, and their exercise was they had to move 15 feet laterally, 15 feet up, in other words, do an outline of the box and keep themselves plugged in. In other words, they had to be able to maneuver in there. And uh, I'm looking at this going, I'm. I'm lucky to be in the same sky as that tank where it's uh, 15 feet. Anyway, anyways, it all worked out, and uh, we got ourselves took on 60, 80 thousand pounds of fuel and went off and did our uh, did our mission. So um, <clears throat> quite, you know, uh, that particular airplane was probably the hardest aircraft that I flew. I flew it for four years and. Uh, you know, it was comfortable by the end of it, but uh, man, oh man, this is an old dog that is, you know, being said, here's your airplane, go out and refuel, and by the way, you haven't seen the tanker you're going to plug into yet. <laughs> so that's amazing. I had an American uh, uh, boss, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, and uh, while I was down there, I got sick, and I went to the Italian, we were on an Italian Air Force base. So I went to the uh, Italian Air Force medical office, and this guy, uh, this doctor, who I had to have an interpreter because he didn't speak English, and so I, an Italian uh, co-worker came, comes along. He says, yeah, here's some pills. You need to take those. You're grounded. And uh, I went, well, I mean, it's not like we have a lot of replacement uh, backup pilots here, and, and uh, okay. So I walked back to the uh, squadron, walked in to tell my boss that you know I'm grounded, and he's at the scheduling board. And uh, I said, sir, uh, got some bad news. I'm uh, medically grounded for probably a week. And he went, ah. He said, my name's on the board there. Barthel, absolutely useless. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Fortunately, I, you know, he was a hard ass. He was not, he was not joking here. He, he was serious. You know, uh, but I laughed because that was the only thing I, I could do. <laughs> so Libya, there was, with that aircraft, I was involved in a couple of operations in Afghanistan, NATO. NATO was not really a part of, of uh, the response to the war on terrorism. It was because the US president declared war on terrorism, but uh, which dragged all NATO nations into the war on terrorism because of a threat against one is a threat against all. So that's how Canada got involved in Afghanistan. But this aircraft here belongs to NATO, and it was uh, based in Gelenkirchen, Germany. And then we had forward operating bases, one in, Tur uh, in Turkey, in Konya, and, and then another one, another one in Greece, and another one in Norway, northern Norway. So while the uh, Afghan war was going on, we would be deployed to Konya, and uh, we would take off from Coney at about four in the afternoon, fly straight south to the Red Sea, pick up a tanker, air refuel, head down to the coast of, uh, to the Horn of Ethiopia, turn north into over Pakistan and air refuel in Pakistan airspace, top up the tanks basically, and then fly into Afghanistan and set up a, a, uh, an orbit, as we called it, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Is Konya a country or a city or? Konya is a is an air force base. It's a city in the middle of Turkey, okay. and uh, it's an air force base. There, one half of it is is Turkish, the other half belongs to NATO. Or they give us space on the NATO side, basically our own base. But uh, so yeah, the role there. So the role of the AWACS, AWAC stands for Airborne Warning and Control or Command System. Uh, and so, in the back of that aircraft, as you can see in the top right, uh, is 29 consoles, basically air traffic controllers that, that uh, are viewing their screen and they can, those little buttons, I don't know if you can see them on the side, but they can bring up a view from 
all over the place. We could we could bring up all the ground-based data, all the radar sites in, in Europe, feed that into one screen, we could see every aircraft in Europe on one screen at one time. That's a pretty busy screen. <laughs> but nonetheless, we could do that. Um, quite the capability. We were training, I was air refueling training over top of Berlin one day. And whenever this aircraft took off, training or otherwise, we went with a full crew. So we're going up to do some air refueling training and all these guys in the back are sitting there twiddling their thumbs because we're not doing a real mission. So uh, anyways, we're air refueling training and one of the guys in the back called the passive controller. And I don't know if we can see it. On the cheeks of the side of the aircraft are, are two bulging regions. And inside there are sensors that can detect the signature of any aircraft built in the world. And by, what I mean by that is when a jet engine starts up, it makes a sound, it has a frequency, and that's called its signature, and they're different. So a MiG-29 has a signature that's different than an F-18, and so on and so forth. So we're over top of Berlin, and uh, the passive controller says, oh, I got a MiG-29 starting engines in Moscow. <laughs> and uh, really, yeah, he's just starting engines. And uh, we said, okay, well, you know, keep us informed. He said, oh, he's taxiing for takeoff. Oh, he's airborne now. Oh, he's turning to the north. He's not, he's not coming this way. So that from Berlin to Moscow was about 800 miles. The official range on this thing is 600 miles, but I can tell you it's a lot more than that. Um, so that's the kind of, uh, of technology or capability the aircraft has. When we were over top of Afghanistan, our role there wasn't necessarily to see what was in the eye, in the, in the air, or in the sky, because there was nothing. But our role there, and this is where the uh, control part comes in, is we were in contact with troops on the ground. And uh, when troops on the ground come in contact with the enemy, they're now in a tick, troops in contact. And so those guys could call us and say, we want you to hit a target, this table, 200 yards, and they give us the Latin long, the precise location. We would pass that to uh, fighters that were along with us, and the fighters would roll in and take out the target. So that was our, that was our role. Uh, if they needed help, any kind of assistance, they could communicate via us to wherever they wanted to talk. And talk to anyone. Some questions. Sure, so I need to wrap this up because I could go on and on and on. Questions? Shoot. How did it handle with the, the uh, thing on the top? Yeah, so this thing had, uh, because of those strakes, as they're called, underneath the dish connecting to the fuselage, that has a big impact on your lateral, lateral stability and control. And where that comes into large play is on takeoff and landing. So our crosswind limitation on takeoff, I think it was 29 knots, which is still substantial, um, but that's that's quite a restriction because you should be able to figure out for even more than that. But once in the air, it felt like a regular. No, it was fine. Yeah, okay. they, you wouldn't even know you had a dish on board. Shoot, Blair, when you're in the air in that great big machine with all those people in the stern there, uh, and you're talking to fighter pilots and you're sending them in a certain area that you, they're going to pick the target and bomb them or whatever. Yeah. Were you ever in fear that the enemy would launch that MiG and send it in your direction? And you're a big target. You know, our tactic was to, for defensive tactic, so we can see a threat coming from 600 miles away, but it's coming at a high rate. Yeah. And uh, so our tactic is to turn tail, push the throttle up, and start a descent and go until we hit the barber pole on, the air, on our aircraft. So we're talking 400 knots. And uh, there's, there's no way that anything that could ever catch us as long as we saw them far enough in advance. Okay. So, but we had no, we, we did have, just as I left, they were installing flares on this aircraft so that if there was a threat that got close enough, we could deploy flares. And flares will attract missiles and send them off in different directions. So, 
When you do a drop like that, does your coffee spill? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you saw that, uh, I'll tell you another little story. So the, that uh, Boeing that I flew, that did air refueling as well. The, uh, the famous story there about the fighter pilot coming up alongside our aircraft and he's doing rolls and he's dancing around and then he gets stabilized and he says, you see that? Pretty cool, eh? Well, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Just a minute. Two minutes pass, there's nothing on the radio. Finally, the pilot comes back and says, so, what do you think of that? What? And the guy says, well, what'd you do? He says, well, I got up and I had a stretch, and I went back and had a pee. <laughs> then I went to the galley and made myself a sandwich and had a cup of coffee. Uh, and I'm now sitting here eating it. What do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> So, it just depends, you know. <laughs> sure. Yeah, uh, when you are refueling, uh, were you affected much by wingtip vortices? So there's another thing. The big wingtip vortices are, is the air that comes off the wingtips. So high pressure under the wing, low pressure on top. Air will circulate off the wingtip as it moves off around the back, off the tips of the wing called a wingtip vortice, and that can be really dangerous for landing aircraft behind you, as John will attest. Um, so there's a story, when we used to fly F-5s, which is a much smaller fighter aircraft, coming in behind the tanker on the wingtip, and he got too close. If he got too close in behind the engines, he could get blown up and back, and then the wingtip vortices off the wings would pick him up, and literally, as the story goes, picked this aircraft up and he went right up, up and over around the tail. You might say out of control for a few minutes <laughs> or seconds. But uh, so the wingtip vortices on, when an aircraft that size goes slow and you need to slow down so that these guys can get plugged in behind you, then the wingtip vortices become bigger and stronger. So it is a hazard, but uh, newer aircraft today like the F-14, the F-14 is such a big aircraft that he couldn't fit in behind the wingtip of a 707. <laughs> so he, when we did the Gulf War and refueled down there, he had to sit sideways, get plugged in, and turn sideways so his wingtip wouldn't hit the tail of our aircraft. That's how big the F-14 was. So yeah, it is a, it is a hazard. Anyone else? Clark? Can you go back over, you mentioned something about making the actual connection uh, for refueling. Did you say there was somebody doing the connection yeah so that top left picture yeah. is literally taken from the uh the viewing with the window <coughs> that that boom is where it connects to the fuselage of the tanker so he's sitting in there in behind and if you could just see that there's little wings on the end of that boom yep okay so i'll just point that out he flies he flies that boom into your into your doors open up and there's a, re, uh, a refueling point, access point right there. But with these wings, he flies that right into your receptacle. You just have to sit there and wait. He plugs in. Mm. Now you can. Where do you okay, last your question, uh, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine. Catherine. Um, do they still use the AWACS? Do they use them over in the Ukraine area at all? Yeah. So there was. Yes, if I was still working there, it'd be a very busy boy. Um, it's it's not supposed to be. NATO is not supposed to be helping Ukraine, yeah. but we are. So we there's an AWACS that remember that Konya base in Turkey. They'd be 24 and 7 out of Konya right now. One AWACS sitting over, over top of the border with Ukraine, not in Ukrainian airspace, but watching everything that goes on and everything that that does happen, that comes the Ukrainians away, including missiles, gets sent to forewarned down to the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. So thanks very much, Blair. Oh, fantastic. Oh. Yeah. Yeah.